anymore, not even with a chain, because he often had been bound with shackles and chains, but he had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt before him. And he cried out with a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. What is your name? He, Jesus asked him. My name is Legion, he answered him, because we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the region. A large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him, send us to the pigs so that we may enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. Then the herd of about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned there. The men who tended them ran off reported it in the town and the countryside, and the people went to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs. Then they began to beg him to leave their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. Jesus did not let him, but told him, Go home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So he went out and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And they were all amazed. Let's pray. Father, help us to be able to not only learn something from this demon-possessed man's story, but Lord, would you use it to lead us into greater faith, to see the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory, and all of his authority, and all of his goodness, and all of his power, and may we continue to be made new in him. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask this. Amen. Well, her, her talent was uh, referred to as the power. It was also referred to as the force. And it was also referred to as the great unknown. Her stage name was the Georgia Wonder. And she was not a Marvel Comics superhero. In fact, she predates the Marvel Comics empire by over a hundred years. She wasn't even a fictional character. Rather, she was a 15-year-old girl from Polk County, Georgia, who had allegedly superhuman strength. Lulu Hurst claimed that she gained this superhuman strength during a violent electrical storm. And in the mid-1800s, her talent had gone beyond just being a local legend, and she became a top-billed performer throughout the United States, making more in a single show than most Americans would have made in an entire year. This helped her to be able to retire, get this, to retire at the age of 16 after only two years of performing. In an era of vaudeville, which consisted mostly of singing and dancing and, and stage shows of, of comedy, um, this uh, Georgia Wonder, this petite teenage girl, would uh, have, uh, have grown men, sometimes in groups, connect themselves to objects such as chairs or a broom handle or household objects like that, and she could literally <coughs> excuse me, pick them up in such ease that she could dance them around like minarets. The Augusta Chronicle said about her visit to Mercer University, this is what they wrote, she then took a large stick, 
Professor Battle and Dr. Brantley and others endeavoring to hold it all were necessitated to jump about the room like jumping jacks. Professor Willett took hold of the stick but was immediately forced to let loose his hold. Miss Hurst invited all in the room to hold the stick. She could, by her touch, force them all to dance around. Lulu Hurst died in 1950, but before her death, she admitted that she didn't have superhuman strength. She never, she never did. Rather, she took advantage of what she knew about physics, something called force deflection. She was so good at this trick that the great Harry Houdini said that, uh, quote, her methods consisted in utilizing the principles of the level and fulcrum in a manner so cleverly disguised that it appeared to the audience that some supernatural power must be at work. Popular Mechanics Magazine said this, that her work was based almost exclusively on the pivot and fulcrum theorem of physics. So this uh, Georgia Wonder may have convinced many people that there was something supernatural about her abilities, but it was all a sham. It was all a fake. It was a, it was a phony act. In our passage today, we meet a man who, like Lulu, had supernatural strength, but it was not a vaudeville performance. It was a demonic possession. Here was a human being like you and like me. However, a large group of demons decided to take possession of all of his faculties. His platform wasn't a stage in a vaudeville production. Rather, it was in a graveyard among the dead. He was sent there so he wasn't a threat to the town. He was a danger both to himself and to those around him. No one was able to overpower him, and any attempts to chain him up were futile because he would just break the chains with his bare hands. Here is a man who is made in the image of God, yet he is violently oppressed by demons. He has no friends. He has no hope of healing. And the rest of his life will be spent in a, cemetery, in a cemetery crying out and hurting himself. Yet one day, this man meets Jesus. And his life suddenly changes. He experiences the power and the authority of Jesus, and he's healed of this possession. And though you and I may not be plagued with the torture of uh, demon possession, Jesus offers you and I, wherever we are in life, his power and his authority. And with that authority, there is hope and there is change. We find that in three ways this morning. The first is that we must confess Jesus' authority. We must confess Jesus' authority. You know, back in July of 2016, the Washington Post ran uh, a fairly controversial article uh, that uh, uh, was titled this. This was its title. As a psychiatrist, I diagnose mental illness. I also help spot demonic possession. The subtitle read, How a Scientist Learned to Work with Exorcists. And so the author, Richard Gallagher, he is a board-certified psychiatrist, and he's also a professor of clinical psychiatry at uh, New York Medical College. So this is no slouch here. This is what he wrote in his article. For the past Two and a half decades and over several hundred consultations, I have helped clergy from multiple denominations and faiths to filter episodes of mental illness, which represent the overwhelming majority of cases, from literally the devil's work. It's an unlikely role for an academic physician, but I don't see these two aspects of my career in conflict. The same habits that shape what I do as a professor and a psychiatrist 
open-mindedness, respect for evidence, and compassion for suffering people led me to aid in the work of discerning attacks by what I believe are evil spirits, and just as critically, differentiating these ex uh, extremely rare events from medical conditions. And he goes on to say, is it possible to be sophisticated psychiatrist and still believe that evil spirits are real, however seldom? Most of my scientific colleagues, he wrote, and friends say no because of their, their frequent contact with patients who are deluded about demons, their general skepticism of the supernatural, and their commitment to imply, employ only standard peer-reviewed treatments that do not potentially mislead or harm vulnerable patients. But careful observation of the evidence presented to me in my career has led me to believe that certain extreme uncommon cases can be explained in absolutely no other way. So in our passage this morning, it doesn't take a clinical psychiatrist in order to figure out that this man that Jesus encounters has a problem with being uh, demon-possessed, that he's not mentally ill. And I understand that there are a lot in our culture that uh, are dismissive of this idea uh, of or skeptical about the existence of Satan and demons. They, they will brush it off as antiquated superstition that since we know better now in our scientific reasoned age uh, that, that we can just dismiss this. And I get those arguments. I understand where they're coming from. Although I get their arguments... I wonder how many of them dismiss this reality because they have never truly encountered any sort of satanic manifestation. I've been close to pastoral colleagues who have indeed dealt with people who have um, experienced this sort of thing. In my 10 years of ministry, there's only been one time that I truly believe that I encountered someone who was uh, demonically driven. And as Christians, we believe that every single word of God proves true, and it testifies to an unseen world in which these things happen. And so, in our passage, Jesus had just gotten done calming the storm on the sea, and thus he proves his, his power and his authority over nature. And now they reach the shore of the Gerasenes, and uh, this, this uh, area that Jesus goes to is a strictly Gentile region, which means non-Jewish, meaning sort of enemy territory for a Jew to go to. And immediately, this man comes out of the tomb and rushes up to Jesus and a few of his symptoms could be chalked up to mental illness. We have a guy that is crying out continually, that is self-mutilating, and, and he's isolated. But the fact that he had superhuman strength shows us that something here is not quite right. Apparently, he had been part of society, and, uh, but became a danger to himself and the community, and they tried chaining him up. When that didn't work, he was banished out to the graveyard. So here's a man who is utterly rejected by the Gentiles. They don't know what to do with him. He's a threat to them. He's a threat to himself. And if they can't chain him up, which, boy, how humane is that? And they might as well just push him away. To a Jew, this man was quadruply unclean. First, he was a Gentile, which was absolutely abhorrent to a Jew. They wouldn't want anything to do with a Gentile. Second of all, it's clear that he's demon-possessed. He's been dealing with the realm of, of the dead that they don't want anything to do with. Third, he's living in a cemetery and dealing with the dead and touching some artifacts that, that might have something to do with the dead makes him ceremonially unclean. But not only that, fourthly, he lived... Uh, in among the tombs, but also among swine, which are the most dirty and disgusting of all creatures that the Jews would have uh, associated with. All of his faculties are being used by this legion of demons. Now, a legion was a Roman battalion which had about 5,600 soldiers in it. 
Now, that's not saying that this man was possessed by almost 6,000 demons, but it is to say that this man was possessed by many, many demons. The only hope, therefore, the only relief for this guy could be death. However, Jesus shows up, and the demons compel this man to go up to Jesus. Now, look with me in verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt down before him. And he cried out with a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Now, notice in in these sentences a couple of things. First, that this man had never before met Jesus. But these demons, they know exactly who Jesus is. Whereas people all around Jesus, including his disciples at this point, don't see Jesus as they ought to. These demons do. And we ought to do well, we would do well to remember this. We are often slow to recognize Jesus for who he is or give credence to him. Yet even the demons recognize him, and they are terrified. Notice also that these demons recognize his power and authority. By asking them to come out of the man, they are tormented. And notice that it says that they beg, they implore Jesus to stop For whatever reason, they are bent on staying in this region. Now look at verse uh, 9 and following. What is your name, he asked them, him. Uh, My name is Legion, he answered, because we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the region. A large herd of pigs was there, feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him, Send us to the pigs so that we may enter them. So in other words, they want to stay in this region. I don't know why, but they want to stay there. And it is here that we must see something incredibly important for understanding our world under the sovereignty of God. In this exchange, why can the demons... Not just leave this man and go into the herd of pigs. Why can't they, when they see Jesus, just run away from him and go do what it is that they think they need to do? It's because nothing happens outside of God's will. Everything is either pre-planned by God or it is permitted by God. R.C. Sproul was correct when he said, There are no maverick molecules in the universe. If there is one maverick molecule in all of the universe, then God is not sovereign. And if God is not sovereign, then God is not God. This legion of demons understand this. They can't even leave this man to go into a herd of pigs without permission. And somehow, we are arrogant enough to think that we call the shots in our lives. Somehow, we think that we know what is best. Somehow, we think that we have ultimate authority over our lives and what happens in our lives. Even a simple illness ought to give us the perfect illustration that we don't control squat. Romans eleven thirty six says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. So what, is, what does Jesus do about this? We'll look in verse 13. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. So these demons that no one could contain, that chains could not 
hold together, Jesus is able to drive out with a word. By his own volition, Jesus had power to do this. Scripture tells us that all of creation was made through Jesus, that he is the one by which all things hold together, and he is able to deliver this man from satanic bondage with a simple word. And we need to recognize this power and authority. If Jesus is able to calm these waves and the wind on on the sea with a word, if he is able to cast a legion of demons out of this one individual with just a word, think about what Jesus can do in your life. That when you know him, you see his power, and you take hold and, and and you come to him in faith. What can Jesus do? You may not be demon-possessed, but your life may seem completely out of control right now. You may feel that you can't keep your shame or your fear or your doubt or your sin chained up, that it keeps breaking itself loose. But Jesus, he can enter the shores of your life. And he can expel those things with a word. Jesus cares deeply about what you are going through. And he doesn't stop there. Not only does he care, but he has the ability, he has the power, he has the authority to do something about it. Confess his authority and, and, and acknowledge his sovereignty over your life and your situation. And secondly, embrace Jesus' authority. Embrace. It's one thing to acknowledge. It's another thing to embrace it. So what happens after Jesus' authority is displayed really shows us a paradigm for uh, two different ways to view Jesus' power and authority. The first one is to utterly reject him. Now, in verse 12, it details what happens to the pigs that the demons enter. Look again in the second part of verse 12. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned there. Now, when I read this, not only does this seem like a waste of perfectly good bacon, but it also creates quite a bit of problems for Jesus as he goes forth, because we're talking 2,000 pigs here, and this is, an, uh, this is an economic powerhouse for this region. And so you can imagine, with 2,000 pigs that had just rushed over the side of a cliff, well, there's a lot of folks that's going to be missing a, a good paycheck because of that. And this is, uh, they get angry, and this is exactly what happens. Look with me in verse 14. It says that the men tended them, ran off, and reported it to the town. And not just, just the town. It says he also went to the, they went to the countryside. And the people went to see what had happened. So these men, who are now economically depressed, they go and they do what anyone does when they're offended by someone else. They go and they try to rally the troops. And this is such a, a wild story that they go and try to figure out if this is true or not. And they come upon the crime scene and notice that their demeanor changes from uh, raging anger to fear. Look in verse 15. They came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. This man was infamous. There was no one in town. There's no one in the countryside that didn't know this person or experience what it was like to be around him. This was the man that the strongest and the most valiant in all their land could not contain. 
Yet they come to a graveyard and they see this guy, perhaps for the first time in years or decades. He's got clothes on. And he's sitting calmly. And he's in his right mind. And they look over and they see this Jew who the Bible tells us doesn't have any sort of physical appearance by which people would be naturally drawn to him. He didn't have the body of a WWE wrestler where he could pin the guy down. In fact, he was probably fairly scrawny. But where they failed to subdue him, Jesus was successful. And not by the, the strength of his two guns, but by the power of of his word by being God incarnate. And this terrifies them. And just as we saw in the previous narrative where Jesus calmed the, the storm with, with a word, the reaction of sinful people to, divi- to the divine is fear and terror. Who is this then? Is the central question that we're asking in this section of Mark. In verse 16, they all get a summary of what happened. It said, Those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs. So they look over and they see that ham is not going to be on the menu for quite a while. And they look over and they see uh, this man. And then they see Jesus. And when they see Jesus... Suddenly, economics is not their biggest problem. Their biggest problem is their sinfulness in light of the Holy One that is standing before them. This is the rightful reaction of any sinful being being in the presence of Jesus. We cannot be in the presence of God without shuddering. We see this in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah has the vision of the temple, and he sees uh, the train of God and the throne, and he says, Woe is me, which is another word for saying, I am completely undone. We don't even really describe in our English language sufficiently what Isaiah was feeling. The apostle John in Revelation, who was known as the disciple that Jesus loved, fell down as if dead when he encountered the risen Lord in all of his glory. And these men of the area who cared more about pigs than they care about people are confronted by Jesus, and they're completely undone. And instead of acknowledging his power and his glory and his authority and worshiping him. Rather, verse 17 tells us they began to beg him to leave. You are a bigger threat, Jesus, to us than this man who we couldn't chain. Get out of our area. Do you see the irony here? The demons beg him that that they could leave his presence. Now, the townspeople are taking on the role of the demonic here by begging him to leave. The unholy wants absolutely nothing to do with the holy. And the same is true for us. When we encounter Jesus and we grasp his power and his authority, how many of us want nothing to do with him? To the world, Jesus is morally repulsive. Jesus asks us that when we come to him in faith, to leave our vices behind and follow him. He promises that the road may be dangerous and that we may need to give up economic freedom to do so. He asks us to be willing to potentially die for his sake. And to too many of us, 
That's overstepping the bounds. That's not allowed. He is impossibly demanding, and it would be better if he just left us alone and went somewhere else. But there's a better way to respond to Jesus, and that's by embracing him. By receiving him, trusting in him. There's a great contrast here between the prideful townspeople who wonder if Jesus can do that to that man, what in the world can he do to me? And then this man who was violently oppressed, yet who in verse 15 tells us that he was sitting at the feet of of Jesus. Not only that, he gets the point of what it means to be a Christian. Look with me in verse 18. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. So to be a Christian is to have the privilege of being with Jesus all the time. This is a joy that we get. That through the Holy Spirit, Jesus is with us. It is to recognize that we're helpless to fix any and all of the situations that we face in our day. It is to come to grips with the fact that Jesus, through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection, has the power and the ability to change our lives. That in his life, he lived sinlessly on our behalf. In his death, he took the punishment that we deserved on our behalf. And in his resurrection, proved his victory over sin and death. In light of this truth, why would we ever beg Jesus to leave? Maybe you aren't consciously sending him away. Maybe you profess Jesus as Lord and Savior, but the way that you're living shows rejection rather than reception. Maybe you've never trusted in him before. Maybe you've never received him truly before. Now is the perfect time to do that, to trust him by faith. Embrace his authority. It's not too late. He is giving you that grace now. Embrace him. And thirdly, proclaim him. Proclaim Jesus' authority. Though this man has a a radical transformation by meeting Jesus, you and I are at a greater advantage than he was. Because Jesus has ascended and because he is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he has sent the Spirit, we have the ability to have the Spirit with us all the time. Ephesians tells us in chapter 1 that the Holy Spirit lives in us and it is the down payment of what God is going to give us when we meet him. And here for this man, he desperately wants to be with Jesus. But Jesus wouldn't have it. Look with me in verses 18 and 19. He went into the boat. The man had been demon-possessed, begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. But Jesus did not let him, but told him, Go to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So why would Jesus, why would he do this? Isn't the best thing for this guy, a baby Christian, to spend time with Jesus? Probably not, according to Jesus here. More importantly, uh, well, 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 first of all, this man is a Gentile. He could be a liability to Jesus' ministry as he goes throughout Israel. But more importantly, Jesus has a mission for, for him. Verse 19, uh, tell, tell, he, Jesus told him to go to your own people. 
Report to them how much the Lord has done for you, how he's had mercy on you. So uh, this man who formerly was oppressed by demons, that the demons were inside of him, inhabited him, controlled him, and now he has been free. He was perhaps the first missionary for Jesus recorded in any of the scriptures. And though he might not be able to tell the whole story of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection, he can certainly tell people how he has changed. His family, the people he previously knew, would have all been aware of what he was like before, what happened, and now he's not that way anymore. And that his transformation could have been nothing short of a miracle. No, you may or may not be able to articulate the finer points of theology, but Jesus did not call us to go and make theologians. Jesus called us to go and make disciples, people who come to know Jesus' power, who have been changed by him and follow him. This man's mission is our mission. And notice the subtle hint of Mark's understanding of Jesus' being God incarnate in verses 19 and 20. Jesus says to him, Go home to your own people, report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. So he went and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus has done for him. So Jesus told him to tell others what the Lord has done. Mark says that he testified to what Jesus has done. Translation, Jesus is the Lord. We ought to confess that. We ought to embrace that. We ought to proclaim that. Friends, What a great calling he has given us. What a great privilege it is to serve our Lord, our Master, our Savior. What a privilege it is to know him. You know, the Georgia Wonder may have convinced people that she had the power and ability that was beyond this world, but it was a complete sham. And maybe we have the power to convince ourselves that we are in charge, that we're the sovereign ones, but that's a delusion. The truth is, is that we are just as helpless as this demoniac, doing, thinking, and saying things that are hurtful to ourselves and to others, totally unable to change our sinful patterns. But Jesus has the power and the ability to give us a new life. We don't have to go keep going on with the status quo. Confess his authority. Embrace his authority. And then proclaim his authority. Trust in him today. Father in heaven, we thank you so much.